now. Okay. Uh, welcome back to everybody who's uh, back here joining us again. And also welcome to everybody who's new. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge our sponsors. Uh, thank you to TD Ameritrade for sponsoring the venue, the space that we have here today. Also thanks to NumFocus for uh, supporting this meetup, as well as Midas at the University of Michigan for providing the food. A couple important points, emergency exits. There's one right over here to my right, and also through the doors that you came through also to, to the right. Please do not take the elevators. Uh, as always, we're soliciting feedback, so if there's any things that as Pi Data Ann Arbor can do better, uh, please let us know. Also, uh, all of our videos, uh, or most of our videos, uh, are recorded and posted on YouTube, and so if you go to uh, tiny.cc A2 Pi Data videos, there should be our playlist uh, that will be uh, available to you. And also, uh, uh, to respect the speaker, unless you have quick questions, try to please hold them until the end. There will be time at the end to ask questions. And always remember that we're in a borrowed space, so do clean up after yourselves uh, in terms of the food. The garbage is over by where the food is. I'd like to remind us of the uh, PyData Code of Conduct and the short version. <laughs> uh, so PyData is dedicated to providing a harassment-free meeting experience for everyone, regardless of gender, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, disability, physical appearance, body size, race or religion. We do not tolerate harassment of meeting participants in any form. All communication should be appropriate for a professional audience, including people of many different backgrounds. Sexual language and imagery is not appropriate for any of our meetup events. Be kind to others. Do not insult or put down other attendees. Behave professionally. Remember that harassment and sexist, racist, or exclusionary jokes are not appropriate for Pi Data. Uh, attendees violating these rules may be asked to leave the meetup. Uh, but otherwise, thank you for making this a welcoming environment for everybody. And of course, we always like to do a, uh, an icebreaker. So this way when you leave, you'll hopefully have met somebody uh, with similar interests. Uh, so the suggestion that we had today was either turn to somebody in front of you, to the left, to the right, introduce yourselves, and tell them your favorite colored sock. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. What color do you prefer for a sock? Yeah, what color do you prefer? <laughs> nice. What about you? Hi. What, what color do you like the most? Black? Cool. I go with orange myself. <laughs> it is bold. <laughs> All right, thank you. We're back. <laughs> So hopefully you will have met somebody at this uh, meetup. Uh, just a quick plug for uh, our This Month in Data Science uh, uh, news story. So uh, Facebook recently uh, announced that they have uh, a, a, a new algorithm that does unsupervised machine translation. So traditionally, to do machine, uh, sorry, uh, language translation between different languages, you need to have a one-to-one -one mapping. But there's some new work that's coming out of Facebook that uh, shows otherwise. That seems to be very promising and interesting. So definitely go and check that out. And I'd like to also mention next month's uh, uh, meetup. This will be uh, done in collaboration with the uh, our user group in Ann Arbor as well. So we have Julia Silgi, uh, who works at Stack Overflow, is one of the data scientists there, and she'll be coming here to talk to us about uh, one of the books that she published uh, in O'Reilly called uh, that's related to text mining using tidy data principles. So definitely sign up for this. And I welcome anybody in the community right now that might have a community announcement, whether you're uh, hiring, looking looking for a job. Are there any, anybody? Uh, let's start with Ben in the back. Thank you. Uh, recruiting, I'm usually recruiting. I'm a recruiter. Um, <laughs> One is like a senior data scientist to lead a data science department for a, for a multinational rental car company out of New Jersey. Another is like a data warehouse generalist who knows ETL and business intelligence for a role up in, a you know, permanent role up in Brighton. And if anybody knows a high trust security person who would like to be a high trust security manager in 
Seattle. Also looking for that. Once again, my name is Ben. Feel free to stop by. Thanks a lot. Yeah, look for Ben in the picture. And I think Haitham had a. Yeah, I'm in China. I work at Jewel Health. Uh, Jewel is looking for a software engineering position. Uh, Jewel Spell jewel. Yes, uh, it's J O O L. Um, there's another jewel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Dan? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm an independent developer. You're standing up. Sure. I'm an independent developer. I've got a long term but intermittent project happening right now. So I've got about uh, two weeks, two and a half, maybe three weeks, a month. Uh, we're taking work on other projects, kind of focused on uh, some EPL stuff, uh, and getting more into uh, data science and the statistical analysis and visualization that comes with that. So, if you need support or you know somebody that does, you might be able to help. Any other announcements? All right, great. So, with that, uh, I'm very excited to uh, introduce our speaker today. Uh, I've been trying to, to get Ermac out here for a while now, but uh, so Ermac used to work for a uh, data science uh, company called uh, Datascope Analytics based out of Chicago, and uh, they were recently, or maybe, maybe a year ago, mm -hmm. a year ago, they were acquired by uh, IDEO, and so Ermac is working there now as their uh, design director, mm -hmm. and he's going to be telling us about uh, the intersection of deep learning and Matt Damon and some, something about the, the, uh, the coolest looking guy. Yes. You're looking at him. So, <laughs> Thank you. so let's uh, welcome Ermac. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, John. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you very much uh, for having me here. I'm really excited to talk here. And I'm going to talk about how deep learning reveals the essence of Matt Damon. That's the name of my talk. But really, um, the actual title of the talk is that I decided that my face looked kind of like a movie stars, and I wanted to prove that using deep learning. So today we're going to go on a journey to prove how handsome I am using deep learning. <clears throat> OK, first of all, who do I think I am? Sean, thank you very much uh, for that um, introduction. I, the reason I wanted to mention one thing just a little bit is that I'm a design director at IDEO focusing on um, our offering that we call augmented intelligence. Um, we call it augmented intelligence. Uh, you know, you can think of it as like a play on words, like artificial intelligence, AI, augmenting people's intelligence. Instead of uh, replacing humans in a machine, let's enhance their uh, skills and capabilities. That's what we try to do. Um, and actually, that's not that different um, from what was happening in the like, first heyday of Silicon Valley. Um, and Steve Jobs said, the computer is the most remarkable tool we've ever come up with. It's the bicycle for our minds. What he was talking about was basically augmenting, like computers uh, augmenting people's intelligence, right? And actually, Steve Jobs and you know, um, the Microsoft, Apple, uh, Bill Gates, they all kind of took inspiration from Xerox PARC, which is in the 50s, 60s, uh, they were really developing how to augment human intelligence. This is like way before deep learning became what it is today, but um, this whole augmentation, augmenting intelligence thing is not a completely new thing. It was there at the beginning uh, of cybernetics as, you know, um, as a discipline. And uh, what you see here is from a paper written by Doug Engelbert. Uh, and he, if you haven't seen this, you should go Google this. Uh, he has given the mother of all demos, basically a computer demo uh, in the 60s that does everything uh, that we do today. It's really mind-boggling. You should see it. But what they were focusing on at Xerox PARC um, to augment people's intelligence was to understand what can we do to take off tasks that are not really suited well to human mind. So here you can see a typewriter, a pencil, a pencil taped to a brick, right? And this is a person like typing the same sentence or writing the same sentence with the same tools. This takes seven seconds, this takes 20 seconds, and this takes uh, 65 seconds, right? What we are trying to do, what I mean by augmenting, augmenting people, is to take something we do like this, remove the brick, and get there. Or even better, get here, right? Um, and this is decidedly different from 
trying to uh, make a writing machine that just like writes automatically instead of you that like you don't have to do anything. What it's doing is it's combining your best thing and <clears throat> some machine doing uh, what it does best to sort of like elevate both. So for example, you're drawing a circle, right? Um, well, you can just like try to draw it like this. This isn't a great, great sort of task for our hand. We kind of like don't do, eh, we're all right. Um, here's one tool that kind of like makes it much, much easier, right? And here is usually how you would draw a circle today, right? Like there are layers in Photoshop and you can move things. But my point in all of this, uh, because I'm about to talk about generating images and like why that could be really, really cool and useful. Um, when you get to this stage, right, you don't have to worry at all. You don't have to spend any buffer in your mind about being careful with your lines and like making sure that you got it just right. If you're at this stage, you can just like draw 20 circles real quick and make something more interesting with it in, in a short amount of time. So um, think about what we've been doing with technology. This kind of stuff has been happening, like I said, for a long time, especially let's focus on uh, personal computer technologies, right? We keep augmenting the next thing so that like the plus between um, uh, humans and machines sort of like uh, elevates both of them. Okay. This is one of my favorite technologies, Control Z, undo. Uh, and I think it's groundbreaking because it takes away the fear of doing something wrong with a computer. But it's also, it didn't come from, um, hey, this like completely new technology is of like undoing things. We discovered it accidentally or as the next natural sort of like stage in personal computer technologies. No, it was about people's needs, understanding um, sort of like what kind of boost does your brain need and then giving it to them. It was, it's basically memory. You just save the states that are previously in memory. It's actually easy technology wise. But figuring out the right augmentation is kind of the challenge. Okay. Um, let's move from this augmentation idea of like, um, like trying to get something done, like writing something. But let's also move towards creative process too. I showed you the circles. Well, if you can draw a circle perfectly real quick, then you can do a lot with them. Um, but can machines and this like new deep learning technologies actually can help inspire us even further than that? Robin Sloan is an author. Okay. And he did this. Uh, he basically uh, built a model, let it read uh, 50 or like, I, no, I don't remember how many, but like a lot of old science fiction books, right? And the model just like generates new sentences or just generates more science fiction text. It's just trying to come up with things that it has seen in old books, right? But here's the cool part. He made this into a plugin so that in the editor, he starts typing a sentence, okay? And then he hits uh, a key binding and the computer just like completes it for him, okay? Hit it again. And if he doesn't like it, he can just like keep doing this. And basically what he's doing is he's getting inspiration from this model, right? This is the system of the man and the machine. And um, basically plagiarism becomes a bit of an issue here. Like, okay, if they have read, like if the model has read all these books, it's not stealing a sentence, but is it stealing something? What's going on there? That's interesting. But what I want to focus on is as these new technologies around us, all this machine learning is developing, this is actually creating a lot of really, really interesting opportunities for us to offload parts of the creative process onto a machine and actually really find um, our own voice, actually in collaboration with a machine. That's really interesting. Here is what he did next after this. Um, it was raining. Cats and dogs is just the sentence. Give me another sentence. She left me forever. What it does is it's trying to, in the meaning space, fill in the gradual sentences that go from this to this. Are you ready? Uh, it's not good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so when you look at it, it doesn't feel like a very smooth transition, right? Um, I wouldn't call this like very useful, but it's interesting, right? What, what we are doing is sort of collaborating with machines in creative endeavors, which is really interesting. 
Okay, and here is like what I want to mainly focus on in terms of this creative focus uh, around um, neural networks and deep learning. So I'm going to talk about generative adversarial networks. Basically, all these faces that you're seeing, and we're going to get back to them, uh, they were imagined by a computer. We just showed a computer a whole bunch of faces. This is what a face looks like. And then asked the computer to generate like more new faces. And these are faces, some of them nightmarish, some of them are very passable as human beings. So um, we'll get to it. First of all, okay, how do you get a computer to look at a bunch of faces and understand what a face is, right? Let's talk about how it works. Okay, so this is actually not a single neural network doing something. It's a framework with like two separate net, uh, networks working with each other, okay? Let's call one of them a forger and the other one a cop, okay? So there's, this is what the forger does, okay? All it does is it takes some numbers, it takes a vector, right? Don't worry about what the vector might be, it's just like five numbers, right? And spits out an image. If you give it the same four numbers, it spits out the exact same image. If you give it different numbers, it spits out a completely different image, right? But it's an image. It's an image maker generator thing. So it could also generate, I mean, it's basically pixels. It could also generate an image that looks like a face, right? Or it could generate something that looks kind of maybe like a face, like all of these are potentials. But what it does is take numbers, give me image. What the cop does is take an image and tell me if it's an actual face or not, right? So it will look at this, think about it, and I don't think that's a face, it would say. It would be correct, this is a fake, this is not a face. Um, then looks at this and it says like, yeah, this looks very much like a face. And again, correct, real. And you look at it and say, is this real or not? Now, um, in this case, I'm also going to say fake. What I mean by real or fake is that this is an actual image of a person's face versus like some um, generated image uh, that didn't come from an actual real photography like um, process. Okay. Now, this basically forges faces. This determines if they're forgeries or not, right? That's the whole idea. We start with like just these dumb things. We didn't train them yet. And obviously we have our millions of images of faces to show the computer, right? Okay. Here's how it all goes. It's an arms race that starts with the forger sending an image to the cop. Now, the forger can either forge one itself or it can pick one from a real image and say, hey, this is a real image. Now, this has to figure out if it's real. Did you really pick it from the real ones? Or did you just like come up with it yourself? That's what the cop has to do. So the forger starts, generates an image, not a real one, sends, hey, here, try this. This is totally a face. I took this from the, uh, from the real set. And the cop very proudly says, no, this is fake. The cop is correct. It understands that it's correct. Doesn't need to change anything. I'm the best cop in the world. The forger is though in real depression, right? Like, I am not worth anything, I am not working, this is not happening. So how is it trying to figure it out? So what it's doing is it's trying to get better at fooling it, right? Like it sort of like makes them a bit more passable. Um, and the cop now is fooled, let's say in this example, and says, hey, this is real. Now, once it realizes, once the forger says, no, it wasn't real, I actually didn't send you a real image, I fake this one myself, I'm really proud. Once the cop learns the truth, then okay, how can I improve myself, right? How did it fool me? How did I not understand that this wasn't real? So then it sort of changes its parameters a little bit and then back and forth. Okay, forger is happy, sends it, now the smarter cop denies it, now the forger needs to get smarter. So basically, these two guys are getting better and better at fooling the other one or catching the other one. Right? So you keep doing this over and over again. You keep sending real images. You keep making some. And basically, as this keeps going, the forger is getting better and better at fooling the cop, and the cop is getting better and better at not getting fooled, where it equilibrates 
in something like this. <laughs> so, uh, and the forger is really called the generator because it's generating images, and uh, the cop is called the discriminator because it's discriminating if it's real or not. Um, but by the end of this equilibrating, this is a pretty good generator. And this is a pretty good, like, you know, cop too, but like, this one really was there to, um, you know, fill the mastermind evil of this guy, right? This is really what we want. We use the cop to get it better. Okay, so, uh, GANs, or Generative Adversarial Networks. Basically, a couple of networks, one generator, one discriminator, which we trained with an arms race. But how do their innards work? What would we see if we ripped open their guts? Well, let's start with the um, more straightforward one, the discriminator, the cop that just has to classify an image and say, fake or real. Okay. Now, let's make the um, problem a little bit simpler while we're working on this. Um, this is an image of an optometrist. I have an irrational fear and hatred of optometrists. Um, so they keep showing you things like that that you can't see. Um, but in this case, this optometrist is just a little bit extra evil, okay? Because he is trying to trick you. Let's zoom in on this. Okay. Well, you probably still can't see it. Let me zoom in more. Okay. Some of these are not letters. So <laughs> this is not a letter. You're not blind. This is just a cruel joke. Okay, this is an O, X, I can kind of see the H. This is fake. C, nope, that's a Y. That's almost like something, but it's not. <laughs> um, okay, so basically, imagine this is what we're trying to do. Some of these are actual real letters and some of those are not letters. By the way, all we did is it's the same problem. We just went from a lot of pixels to three by three, uh, grayscale and, um, letters instead of faces, but it's the exact same problem for the cop. Okay. Now, this is of course an age-old machine learning sort of uh, thing to do, classification. We are going to take some images and say real or fake. Okay. Um, we're going to train this model and then it can basically take an image and tell us what it is. So, um, a very straightforward, really old school, you know, like standard way of doing classification. One of the first like machine learning things that you learn if you study machine learning is like um, logistic regression. Okay. Uh, basically, we need to represent our image uh, with some features, um, send it to a logistic regression, which will give us a probability of this thing being a real letter or a fake letter, right? So, and basically, um, obviously the 50% probability is the cutoff. So if our model thinks 60%, this is an actual letter. So we're going to go with like real letter. Okay. So that's how it goes. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and how do we, what kind of features do we use though? How do we represent these images by numbers? That's actually pretty straightforward too, right? Like these are basically matrices of, um, how dark a pixel is, right? So. Uh, and there are nine pixels, so you can think of those as like, those numbers represent this image, okay? You give it uh, to the logistic regression. Let's say this is an H. It does well on the reality score. 80%, good. 3%, not real, good. But the problem with this is it cannot catch complex local and nonlinear relationships. It cannot understand all the, uh, like how all of these things intricately play with each other. It, it is, it cannot extract these structures of lines crossing um, to make a T and an H. Like it actually focuses on like, how strong is this guy here or not? So it can learn maybe like, uh, with a lot of data, like very, very specific uh, shapes, but it is uh, difficult to capture all these nonlinear complex local relationships. So deep learning comes to rescue, right? Like what happens is you go logistic regressions of logistic regressions, right? Um, so what, do, what you do is uh, let's focus on local areas of an image, okay? This is called a convolutional neural network. This, these have been around for a while as well. Uh, we have been using them to classify images for, for quite a while. Um, so 
what it does is, hey, okay, instead of the entire image, what if I just focused on this area, right, this window, okay? So this guy is only going to uh, basically represent with a single number what's going on in here, okay? Um, then we slide the window. This guy is focusing on those four features. This guy is focusing on those four, this guy on those four, right? And then, um, remember these were like this square and that square. Now I can do the same sort of sliding window of convolution by making this guy focus on these three, this guy on these three, okay? So basically what we've done is we've added X additional layers and the very, very final number that we're representing is again like 0 0.8 or 0 0.3. That's the probability of the whole image being real, right? And these functions in here are basically um, representing something about the content of these sliding windows. That way, by sliding the windows, we can capture those local um, intricate sort of like complex nonlinear relationships, right? Um, if any of you have dealt with any like natural language processing, actually the idea of engrams where instead of counting only the word frequencies, but actually also counting sort of phrases or multiple words uh, next to each other, isn't that far removed from this idea, right? You basically kind of zoom in on local parts um, and then bring them all back together. Okay, so the one thing about deep learning though is I should tell, um, the history of deep learning really isn't like, hey, we came upon this like really simple idea and like once it clicked, it worked. It, it's not, it's really not like that. There is a lot of that, but also a ton of mathematical hacks and oh, like rectified linear units work really well in this architecture. And then, well, when we do batch normalization instead of dropouts, like there are all these mathematical tricks and stuff. So um, part of the reason I'm saying this is if you're not super familiar with like deep learning, uh, if you want to get your hands dirty, um, I would really recommend, I mean, maybe like the uh, simple ideas from scratch, implementing them from scratch might be useful. But if you want to play with these latest sort of like technologies, it's good to um, take some of the implementations that already exists by, by people and sort of like go from there because uh, all these sort of mathematical hacks are taken care of uh, in that kind of like code base. Okay, uh, here's how it actually looks like. This was our toy example of the letter. This is the discriminator from the 2016 DC GAN paper. Um, one thing you'll notice is we had three by three by one as our initial met image. This is 64 pixels by 64 pixels and red, green, blue three dimensions, right? So we are basically making that five by five window that's sliding, right? Because you're sort of sliding that window, you're actually getting like a narrower, smaller one. So now it's 32 by 32. This, these are no longer images. This is basically, um, think of it as like matrices in different levels. And because in here, we don't know what this number really represents. We, all we know is that it's about this part of the image. We don't really understand what this number is doing, but when we train the whole thing for this to work out, it works out. But it is hard to like say uh, if during the running of this, this is spitting out a five that's going in there. Um, what does that mean? We don't know. So again, in here, you can see this kind of almost like as a shortening and elongating of an image but it's no longer really an image-like thing here anymore. Okay, so basically, but then we keep doing this until at the very end, we have our final basically logistic regression. It's very close to logistic regression, um, which gives us a single number. Take an image, single number. Okay, so this was a discriminator, how it worked, okay? Uh, and what about the generator? The kind of a little bit more interesting one, um, well, actually sort of like what it, will, what it will do is take a bunch of numbers and return a three by three by one matrix, right? So actually, maybe it's not that surprising, but when you look at it, there are some like minor details, but it looks almost like the opposite of the discriminator, right? Like there we started with a, with a big image 
and I ended up with a single number. This is a very similar structure in terms of the um, matrix sizes and stuff, but we start with 100 numbers and end up with an image. And these weird things that you see is just that when you're going reverse, that convolutional window sliding becomes a bit more complicated because of like some geometric algebra thing. But, um, but basically, it is the reverse of starting with 100 numbers and um, ending up with, a, um, with an image. And um, I did all of this using TensorFlow. Like the code is uh, online. You can actually go play with it yourself as well. But uh, as I was saying, it's really useful to sort of take some actual implementations of like new papers and technologies out there. It really um, solves a lot of the headaches already for you. And uh, believe me, it can still like create a bunch of headaches. And also, um, there are a bunch of, um, uh, like when I was working with these, I've actually corrected like a couple of bugs in there, which is like very normal. I'm sure I introduced some of my own. So um, build on top of um, other people's work. <laughs> um, the reason I wanted to show this is just this part of the code. Just wanted to show you with TensorFlow like how simple it might look. That entire architecture that I was showing for the discriminator, this is the code to, to describe it. This is it. And this is the generator. Like you can see, there is a it's a little bit more wordy, but like it's really um, a good interface where you can take like an idea like that and actually convert it into code without much difficulty. And I didn't wrote it. That was basically uh, Taehoon Kim. And I also used some of Brandon Amos's work. OK. So I went over like how these things work, right? Like the arms race, now I can actually generate um, faces that the discriminator can't even tell from real faces. That looks great. Um, and basically, what we ended up with is a good image generator, right? So those 100 numbers, right? You can think of them as basically 100 numbers that describe the properties of a face. And our generator will take that and turn it into a face. Now, we have no idea what any of those 100 numbers really refer to or have any sense of like, hmm, I want a more um, glass-wearing face. I should change these numbers towards this direction. Like, without actually going deep down and creating vectors that specifically do specific transformations, that is hard to do. We don't understand what those 100 numbers are. Um, but what we can do is, hey, now that technically any image that it creates is supposed to look like a face, we could just give it random numbers for those features and like, hey, what kind of faces does it come up with, right? So let's create a bunch of numbers, give it to them, and here are some faces that it generated for me. Um, again, I want to show like something like this, right? Where this is not a psychopath at all, I think. Um, uh, this person is melting. This is not really a person. And here again, like pretty passable. And please don't haunt my nightmares, right? <laughs> I don't think that person has eyes. OK. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the thing is, what it has learned is a lot of these complex linear relationships. Like it knows, oh, hey, this like nosy kind of thing. And it knows that there are like a million different noses. And when I say it knows this, obviously it doesn't have an understanding or a representation that we could understand. But it has understood those like local complex relationships. And sometimes it doesn't work out really well, but it still like at least has the shape of a face. And remember, I could always train this more with more images too. So this isn't like the ultimate end of the um, algorithm. So more images, some interesting things to note, like you can see glasses somewhere. The images, those two million images have people with glasses on them, but not as much, not as many as regular people without glasses. So um, glasses occur like not so much, but it kind of pulls them off, right? OK. Uh, and more faces, like with the coolest sunglasses, this person wins. Um, but OK, I didn't even begin to tell you about the cool part, OK? So those 100 numbers, that vector representing a face, that happen that, that they live in a linear space. What that means is you take those 100 numbers, right? take one of them, and very slightly change it and give it to the generator again. The face it comes up with 
is going to be slightly different indeed, but it will be very close to that, to that first face that I started with. So similar vectors give you similar faces. What's even better is you can actually do algebra with faces, right? These are linear vectors that you can add and subtract from, right? You can go to this point, which represents this image, and hey, jump to that point by adding this vector or subtracting that vector. You can do math with, you know, um, let's take a smiling woman, let's remove the neutral woman, add a neutral man, we have a smiling man, right? Like, you can uh, play with glasses. Um, what's happening is, again, we don't have like these two numbers tell me what the glasses are, or like how the glasses should look like. It's not like that, but we can actually construct these subtraction and additions to basically figure out like what's missing, like what's in here but not in these, for example, right? Okay, this is fun, doing math with faces. Um, all right, but let's get back uh, on track because as I mentioned before, this is all about my vanity. <laughs> so, um, now that we have a generator, okay, um, like what numbers would a picture of my face uh, take? I'm kind of curious about that, right? Um, so, if I could actually take a face and go the opposite way and sort of like figure out what numbers um, that face actually uh, is represented by, then I can do math with like any face that I want, etc. So, great, let's get started. Um, here's our dilemma. This is what the generator does. It takes those hundred numbers, gives me an image. Doesn't work the other way around. We didn't train it to do anything like the other way around. So um, basically what you have to do is, all right, which input will generate this? Like one really stupid way of doing this is that obviously, hey, let's keep generating random uh, vectors until we hit my face, right? Not very efficient, obviously. Um, but so for searching large spaces, um, we have like a lot of optimization algorithms, right? Like, so all I have to do is, what if I started from a random face and then just push the numbers a little bit in the direction where it would make it look a little bit more like my face, right? And keep doing that and keep doing that until I get the numbers. So what I'm doing is basically giving you a, giving you a bunch of numbers, you give me a face. I'm comparing the pixel values of, of that face with my image, and then I'm calculating a score of like how well of a match it is. And then I'm trying to get to a better match by nudging those numbers, right? Okay. Um, one thing to note also, this works better if you don't only just try to make the exact same picture by focusing on pixel differences. Um, you know how the discriminator is also sort of like having an idea about how real the face is? Like it will say, this is 80% a real face. I'm almost sure, right? Like that 80%, I'm also trying to maximize that so that it looks like a real face and not like one of those nightmarish creatures, okay? Because, you know, like vanity. Okay. Now, um, here's me telling the computer to generate faces that look exactly like these pictures of my face horrible lighting, all like cropped out of Facebook or something. Um, they're different. There are some black and white, some with glasses. I'm curious how it will do. All right, here we go. Boom. <laughs> all right, no, I'm, I'm kidding. Remember how I said we will start with like completely random faces? Yes, this is not what it came up with to mimic this. <laughs> so this is uh, each of this a completely random 100 number vector. So basically a random face. It's just more random faces. But now I'm going to start nudging each of them to the corresponding one, right? Like, so this is how they change as I change the 100 numbers. Yeah. See? They're turning into me. Yeah. Except that guy. <laughs> <laughs> and here's one interesting thing, too. So um, do you see this? I have glasses. And here... I don't have glasses, and I, I, I'm trying to look like Clint Eastwood or something like doing this squinty thing. Um, but this is interesting. This is telling us, well, it couldn't repl like replicate the um, glasses here, probably because it hasn't seen enough um, similar glasses in context to figure out like how to do that or something. But what it does is remarkable. It actually sort of, all right, gets rid of the glasses, and it still looks like my face without the glasses, which is really, really interesting. 
Um, and you can also see that like these are not perfect, right? First of all, 100 numbers instead of all those like 64 by 64 pixels is much smaller. So we are actually compressing things. Um, but more than that, basically with like the amount of training, et cetera, that we've given it, um, it doesn't, it cannot create any type of face image, right? It's sort of like limited in what it can do. And this is why there are like these, some of these differences in, in here. Okay. Um, now, uh, since it worked with my face, uh, and also to be honest, like this, um, the faces that I trained it on were celebrity faces. This is a free to access academic data set out there on the internet that you can play with too. Um, so these are all actual Matt Damon faces. These are all random faces that again, I just randomly generated. We're going to nudge all of these into these. Are you ready for the Matt Damonification of these faces? Yes. Okay. Let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, it's working. <laughs> Yes. Again, some of them are like pretty close. Um, I think these are okay. Uh, and some of them are like not so well, but you get the idea. Finally, we can't like, if you're going Matt Damon, we can't not do this with George Clooney either. So here are Clooney's, here are wannabe Clooney's. Okay. So by this point, I have a bunch of numbers for a bunch of my pictures for a bunch of Matt Damon's pictures and a bunch of George Clooney's pictures. Remember, the whole idea is to prove that my face isn't that different from this beautiful face. <laughs> um, by the way, I chose someone without facial hair, mostly to show you like how that changes and like how, um, how that affects things. And remember, for either of these faces, I now have a set of numbers that I know if I give it to the generator, the generator will create something that looks a lot like that, all right? So I know the numbers for this guy, I know the numbers for this guy. What if I actually went from here and slowly, like in a hundred steps or something like that, slowly go from this vector to that vector and actually showed every single uh, interpolated image in between, right? That way, well, the one right here, the one close to here, will be really close to this face. The one here will be really close to my face. But this should be a smooth transition. What's more, it should be that like anything in between should be able to pass as a face too. So it's not like, hey, just like fade out from this, fade into that. But everything in between needs to be a face. Okay. Computer, turn my face slowly and gently into Matt Damon's. Are we all ready? This is what we've been wielding for, so let's go. Okay, first I turn into a demon, and that's Matt Damon. Whoa. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> that's what I said. Um, okay. So uh, each of those uh, images that you're seeing corresponds to a different vector in between those vectors. Okay. Um, and this was like my goal all along, like look how similar we are, right? Um, but uh, one thing I was also curious about was, okay, so all those different images, obviously like my face doesn't have a hundred number vector associated with it. An image of my face has, right? Like obviously the lighting, the colors, every, the framing, everything has to do with something. Like my face doesn't have those numbers. This has a separate set of numbers. This has a set of, separate set of numbers. So. Okay, this is a linear space. So in this space of vectors that represent these faces, this lives here, that lives here, that lives here. So like, what if I found the points right in the middle, the average vector? That should be like the essence of my face, right? Like this is kind of like, what is the stereotypical Urmak face shared along all those um, different sort of images? Okay, so this is my essence a shady um, goatee. <laughs> um, keep in mind also, this isn't that many images. I, I, I have a feeling like it would actually get clearer if um, I could use more than just something like 10 
uh, images for me. But this is the platonic Matt Damon, the averaged out Matt Damon. And this is the Eigen Cluny. <laughs> so one thing you'll notice is that these two movie stars' essences look a lot like each other's and very different from this guy. <laughs> so this is the point where I was starting to get sad and stop tinkling with the Gans. Um, but I just want to share, before we finish, I just want to share like a couple of uh, moments that like blew my mind right after I've sort of like played around with these. And obviously we have to play this out. This is the most important slide. Um, okay. So um, here is what did this to me. Um, now, we actually did, like, they actually did this stacked GANs uh, on top of each other. There are actually two stages. Um, the first stage kind of uh, generates a rough draft, almost like think of like a painter doing a sketch first and then putting in the details. Um, and not only that, uh, actually this whole thing is now coming with text descriptions. So basically they showed it a whole bunch of bird pictures and said, this here is a blue bird with a white wing and a small brown tail or something like that, right? And here's the image. So basically, once you train it like that, you can, instead of just saying, hey, give me a random bird image by, you know, like generating 100 numbers and turning it into an image. Instead, you can say, remember those coupling with the descriptions? Hey, generate images of a small bird with a white breast, light gray head, black wings and tail. And this is what it imagines. These are all, again, not real birds completely generated and hallucinated by a computer given this prompt, right? And it's mostly correct, right? Like, so the white breast, light gray head, black wings. Yep. I find that fascinating. One other thing, by the way, a lot of birds, like this is coming from National Geographic or something. Like you can see the background is blurry. Uh, that's because of those like lenses that they're using, like really, really shallow um, focus of depth. Uh, and it has also learned to make backgrounds like that because that's what it's seeing, right? So remember, it is not necessarily learning what a bird looks like. It is learning what a National Geographic image of a bird looks like, kind of, too. So <laughs> keep that in mind. Um, and I just wanted to show you this thing, the first stage, second stage thing. Like it starts with this and then in second stage it turns into that, right? Rough shapes and then details. It's really cool. Um, and finally, um, so at the beginning, I talked a little bit about augmenting intelligence and what that means in terms of creative endeavors, right? Like um, right now, people are working with um, GANs, for example, uh, in different uh, areas such as, hey, let's generate a bunch of assets for video games real cheap or something like that, right? Um, there are not directly GANs, but related technologies like deep fakes where they put um, a famous person's head onto like a porn scene or something like that. Um, so there are like a variety of ways this is being used. But the thing that um, excites me the most uh, is things like, can we create uh, tools for creators where, um, okay, you want to, let's say, make a scene and quickly try different emotions. Like, is it like, what would this look like if this person's smiling or not? Or like you start with like a sentence and you could make it shorter or longer. Or um, in this case, hey, the different versions, a molecule could, um, uh, could shape itself uh, and then what the properties of that uh, could be. So a lot of, um, a lot of ways to take away really, really difficult tasks from uh, people's minds and then turn it, putting it into a slider so that they can focus on creating with those things instead of focusing um, on tasks that are not directly related to that creative endeavor. And this is going all the way back to removing the brick from that pencil, right? And finally, I have the image of the most ridiculous Star Trek of all, Star Trek VI. Um, in this, they go back to the 20th century and Scotty here is talking to a mouse saying, like, this is how you make transparent aluminum. And then they like 
make some transparent aluminium and I save some whales. But <laughs> um, what this is reminding me is that we are slowly getting there, right? Like all the minutiae of like figuring out what the uh, molecular diagram should look like, etc. That's done by the computer in this crazy out there like science fiction uh, campy craziness. Uh, but we are getting there, right? Um, you can just like do this sliding and um, we are pretty close to living in the future. Thank you very much. We have time for some questions. Let's start in the back in the red. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so you mentioned how in your generative adversarial networks that you need to, you essentially need to tweak the input images until you get something that resembles like a real image. And Mm -hmm. um, that's essentially a gradient. And I know that mm -hmm. um, one of your first examples was with English sentences. Yeah. Now, I don't think that those English sentences were actually generated with generative adversary mm -hmm. networks because you can't take um, gradients with respect to the screen items like that. So can you give some, um, can you give some insight into how you would apply GANs or some generative network to sentences? Can you repeat the question? Sure. Um, the question was, um, with images, for example, we have to uh, keep making little adjustments until we find the right um, image. Like we have to adjust the vector to find the right image. Uh, what this means it is it needs to be something continuous where you could make small adjustments and um, uh, the result changes slowly so that you can calculate gradients or how things will change in different directions. and. Uh, basically do what we do here. So going back to Robin Sloan, the question was about, um, well, you can't really have gradients with sentences, so um, how does that work? And indeed, you basically need a continuous space. So uh, with images, like you can have a tiny, tiny amount of difference between one image and the other one. Basically, one pixel could be slightly darker. But uh, with words, for example, it is difficult to go from one word to the other. You're making a jump, basically. Um, what Robin Sloan is using there, and also this has been used with like word to vec type of things, is that um, you can still assume a continuous space, and discrete things like words live in that continuous space, and you can kind of play around in that continuous space. What this means is that you make a little gradual difference and the output is exactly the same word or the same sentence. So we don't have those gradual differences, but um, not unlike uh, starting with the word king, for example, and representing it as a vector, and then subtracting queen, um, sorry, subtracting man and adding like woman gives you queen, something like that. You can do math with these vectors uh, what happens with um, sentences or words, though, is basically um, you have to do subtraction and addition, like you have to figure out the vectors and then uh, add and subtract them. And what, where you end up is basically in the vicinity of a word or a sentence. And then you find the closest word or a sentence. So um, there is still like uh, things we can do in those discrete spaces, not as easy as sort of like training again on faces. Yes. I was curious how, like, in your work with augmented intelligence at IPO, mm -hmm. what are what are some ways that you're using either techniques like this or other related techniques for, mm -hmm. for this? Yeah. Um, good question. Um, so at IDEO, what we really focus on is human needs, right? So in a project, for example, um, almost the first half of the project would be talking to people. Um, also exploring like exploratory data analysis, that kind of stuff. But, um, and usually we use deep learning very, very rarely because it like really right now there are some very, very specialized specific sort of um, problems which it can, it can work really, really well in. And we can use something like that in terms of like, um, you know, as a intermediate process. But, we did something around fashion, for example, where we took all the images of um, uh, of a certain year of like fashion uh, designs, and um, we first used deep learning, um, basically already trained 
um, models for image classification to represent them in terms of like features that are meaningful. Um, and then we basically mapped out all those images so that like similar images are next to each other. Um, and you can kind of see on a given year, like which area is crowded, what type of like styles are used a lot, as well as, ooh, there's like a gap in here. So maybe there's an opportunity to create. And in fact, not that we did that, but you could do something like, hey, this is a map with like a lot of the polka dot dress stuff here. And you know, like these sort of like summer dresses here. And ooh, there is a bit of a gap in between. You could click here into that gap and it could use GANs to actually generate something that would go in that part of the map for you. Right? So this is one example of like how we use, uh, how we might use these kind of things. But honestly, um, when I was working with this, like I said, it was this completely vanity. I wanted to sort of get familiar with the technology. Um, it was just a fun way of playing with it. Obviously, it gives you like an idea of like how it works. And then um, the next time you're doing, you're in an ideation session in front of a whiteboard, like with post-it notes, um, trying to come up with like how to do something, it just pops up and then you can do it. So um, yeah, long story short, um, we don't use these things that much yet, but hopefully more soon. Yes. Um, they're able to play around with sound where they get, a, you know, record an actual person's voice. Mm -hmm. And then they're able to transfer that person's voice to someone else speaking mm -hmm. using similar technology. Yes. And now I can actually, you know, talk and you know, I watch the presentation and everything. Mm -hmm. If they can talk on the phone and actually sound like that exact person, like Donald mm -hmm. Trump. Mm -hmm. That technology is here today. Yes. What about video conferencing where now I can sit in front of the computer, mm -hmm. not only do they see me mm -hmm. or hear me speaking as Donald Trump, but now see me mm -hmm. on the computer screen. I am Donald Trump to them. They yes. hear me and see me using yes. this technology. Yes. Are computers powerful enough to handle that or do we still need to supercomputer oh. process all this instant because a lot of this is, mm -hmm. is showing just stationary pictures. Yes. But actually to show a video. Yeah. Um so that kind of stuff, which is like where, where they're transferring one type of movement from um, one source to the another. Um, yeah, they have, they have been working on this. It is like now working really, really well. Um, and very, very soon you could just do it like on your computer too. Like in, in fact, I bet it's going to be like on, uh, there are going to be filters on Snapchat and like the, the Donald Trump like uh, filter. I don't know if that's going to happen. but. Uh, but you know those like uh, on Zoom or Google Hangouts, you can like click something and it gives you like a little funny hat or something like that. So basically it's just an extra, like that is getting way better is, what, is basically what's happening. Um, but I also wanted to mention another thing. Um, there's also a lot of worry around it, right? Like so you can fake, um, you know, this complete other person. But to that, I feel like Photoshop has been around for a while. And you know, like this has been photoshopped is like a part of our you know language now. We understand it. I, I know this is shop because of the pixels is like something else, but you know, so we have biases around it. We have um, different mechanisms uh, around it when somebody's like um, voice today, like when tapes get released, for example, people still say this is manipulated because it is possible to manipulate and edit them, right? So it's not like suddenly we have a whole bunch of new technologies and we don't know what's real anymore. I feel like this is just an extension of um, this type of mimicry that has been in our lives already. We just have to adjust and get used to it. In the back. Uh, when you were talking about, your, your show, you showed the average of all of your faces, like in the yeah. space of the train GAN, you had said that you thought if you had more examples of your face, mm -hmm. that the average would become clearer. And given mm -hmm. that you're searching through the space and already trained model, this seems very counterintuitive to me. Mm -hmm. I was curious if you could explain more why you would expect uh, the average to become sharper with more samples. Um, sure. Uh, think of it like, so if you actually do this in pixel space, like you take all of my images and average them, um, that still looks like an average face. And it actually sort of lo looks a bit unlike you, like things get more symmetrical and then you suddenly stop recognizing yourself and stuff. Um, but with that, if you average like more images in pixel space, things get clearer. 
mostly because uh, if you just take the pixel averages of like two things, like two images, it's going to look like ghosty because things like one nose will be here, the other one will be right next to it, and you'll be able to see it. But if you superimpose like a thousand images, right, like it will be kind of like quick sketching where you go over the same line a hundred times and now it looks right, even though maybe none of the individual lines look like, right. So I'm still talking about just averaging all the pixels of my faces. I'm not talking about vectors or anything like that. Um, but just because these are different uh, images with like, it is not only capturing what makes my face my face, it is also capturing, am I looking that way? Is it like black and white? Like is the light hitting me here? So if you had more of those, um, the parts of that hundred number vector that deal with that kind of would get rid of itself through noise, hopefully. And then the things that are more about my face would be left because those exist on every single vector. But the little noisy things that can make things blurry are not the same on every single one. So the more vectors you have, the better it is. It's not that it has learned my face or anything. Like you said, it is not learning my face. I'm just saying if you average more things, um, you know, the, the, the noise cancellation will make the thing sharper. Maybe time for one more question. Brian. Uh, what made you pick GANs over something like a variational autoencoder where people are specifically trying to interpret Yes. Um, and it, so the question was, um, why YANs and not something like variational autoencoders like, or other um, generative uh, things? And um, it's true, GANs are not the only sort of, they're not even the only deep learning uh, based uh, image generation uh, framework. Um, I wanted to play with GANs um, mostly when like they came out, like in 2016, they were like everywhere. And then people have been working on them and improving them with different sort of loss functions and stuff. I just wanted to really get familiar with it. I was already kind of familiar with um, what autoencoders can do. And um, for others, like if you don't know, autoencoders are very similar, but a single um, network that is, again, wanting to create images. It starts with um, an image, right? Let's take my image. We start with it turn it into 100 numbers, and then blow it back up to itself. So it's kind of like, hey, if I compress you into these 100 numbers and then blow you back up, um, which compression scheme will give me the best reproduction at the end? Right? So I'm trying to basically figure out how to represent this image in 100 numbers so that I can create it from representation again. So it's another uh, method. And then you just train it. You do it with, again, millions of images, and it learns how to represent that. What's even better, it actually uh, does go both ways. You could give it an image and get numbers, or you could give it numbers and get an image. So, but um, they, don't, they don't look as convincing as GANs in some cases. Obviously, this is a subjective remark, but People have been coming up, like I said, with interesting um, loss function formulations, which do tend to correlate with how we also think of, its, of an image's quality. And GANs have been doing better. So new technology wanted to learn it. And uh, they're interestingly different than uh, other images. Great. So I've definitely learned a lot today. <laughs> and I hope you did as well. So let's uh, give uh, Ermac another round of applause. Thank you very much.